Good morning, New Day. We're so glad you are with us this morning. Let's stand and begin. This morning, I think I was going to point right back over there. Oh, there you are. You moved. You moved places right there. She's waving at you. You can find information back there if uh, you want information about the church. And so uh, I was. Uh, Pastor Dustin was talking to me this morning. He said, uh, find, "Nick, find something you're thankful about and tell him." And I said, "Okay." And uh, he put a little pressure on me. But you know what? God brought to my mind that I'm thankful to be here with you. The scriptures say this, that we know we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And you know what? 
it's good to see you guys again. It's good to be here worshiping with you guys and with, around other believers. So uh, thank you for being here this morning. And as we continue to worship, why don't I lead us in prayer and we'll, we'll continue in our worship. Father, thank you so much this morning for this body of believers here at New Day. Thank you for what you're doing amongst us and in our lives, Lord God. You never stop moving, Lord Jesus, and we can't thank you enough for that. Uh, Father, I, I pray that this morning that everything that Dustin says, Lord God, would be from you, that you'd, you'd strengthen his mind, you'd strengthen his body, Lord God, as he comes and ministers the word of life to us, Lord God, that it would penetrate our hearts. We know that in these days, Lord God, these are perilous times in the world. Father, we are watchful for your son's coming. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Father, I cannot thank you enough for this morning, for us being able to gather here and be here with one another, but you worship with us. The Spirit of God is here. So whatever happened this trans whatever happened or transpired this past week, if, if it was a glorious Thanksgiving and there's a lot to be thankful for. But maybe this was a tough week. Maybe it was a reminder of ones you've lost. Maybe it's a reminder of things that have just gone wrong in the year 2023. Maybe the happiest days have been the hardest. We just sang something so beautiful. It was when the enemy wanted to come and steal our joy. When he wants to come and steal that which God has blessed us with, we can bleed the blood of Jesus. It's not his to take. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but the Spirit of God gives life and it gives freedom. And he has no claim on us, for we are his children. So we pray this morning, Father, that as if whatever our heart situation is, let our posture be one of worship and humility because you are worthy. The inescapable truth is that you are the creator of the universe and it is you who rights the wrong, so you are worthy of praise. And as the scripture teaches us, you came down in the form of a man. Three persons, one being. And Jesus went through it all. And he earned the right back into the kingdom with his death, burial, and resurrection. And with that power, we ask that you would speak to us, Lord. Help your servant to decrease so that you may increase. Father, I am just a broken vessel in need of a savior. So we are here for you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. You all may be seated. It is so wonderful to be here and worship with everybody. We had a great time at family camp last weekend. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a little taste of heaven. We all get to spend time together. Um, and we will do it again, but it won't be for two years. So we're going to alternate. So next year, when we would be doing family camp, we're going to do a mission trip to Portland. So be saving, be praying, be thinking about that. Um, so next year will be a mission trip to Portland, Oregon, and the year after that we'll be back at family camp. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to continue our walk through the book of Hebrews. So if you want to open up your Bibles, your tablets, phones, whatever you're comfortable using, to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. We're going to try and work our way through the whole chapter today. And as you remember, the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrew people. So it assumes a lot about its reader. It expects the reader, the hearer, to know about the Jewish people, Jewish customs. And today is one of those days that really connects us to our Jewish roots. It's amazing. I have talked to people who are Jewish, and I bring up the fact that Jesus was Jewish. And they go, what? Jesus was a Jew? I said, yes, he was Jewish. Actually, all 12 apostles were Jewish. All the founders of Christianity we're Jewish, but God had a plan to incorporate everyone. See, even from the beginning, the plan for the Israelite people, as the Bible says, was for them to be a lighthouse unto the nations, that God was going to use them to reach everyone else. And we saw that a little earlier in this book when we talked about the high priest Melchizedek, that's the order in which Jesus comes from. That mattered because Jesus doesn't have the genealogy, he doesn't have the privilege, he doesn't have the earthly qualifications to be a priest, but yet he's the highest priest. Because God was working in other places, and God has been, and God will be. Because God is looking to redeem all people and bring them under him. So if you'll read with me in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1, we're going to go through verse 10. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship, an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which there was a lampstand, and the table, and the bread of the presence. And it's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, 
and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes. And he went but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offered for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. And by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. This is symbolic of the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot, be per that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but they deal only with the food and the drink and the various washings and regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. So what this is telling us, it's reminding the Jewish people of where they came from. Now, I don't know about you, I am not a first century Jew. Right? This required me to learn some things. And so this was talking about the tabernacle, not the temple. That is, those are different things. So the temple was a rock-made place that was glorious um, in Jerusalem. The tabernacle, which this text is talking about, is when the Israelites were freed from the Exodus, they were freed from Egypt, and they wandered, God had a tent of meeting that he would dwell with the people of Israel in. But he couldn't freely dwell with people because people were sinful. His holiness was not allow him to. And so there was this tent of meeting, and it looks a lot like planting a church. It was one of the early descriptions we used when we first started, because every family had something they were in charge of in the tent of meeting. Somebody was in charge of the lumber. Somebody was in charge of, of, of the, the tent itself. Some were in charge of the seating. Some were in charge of the showbread. Everyone had a place in the tent of meeting. Everyone had something to offer when worship came. And so it would have been a little different, though. It would have been like if we asked each of you to bring your own chair and, like, your chairs for your neighbor, and then to bring the rest of the building, too. So when somebody didn't show up to church, they'd be like, I cannot put this tent stake up, right, unless they get here. It would have been a very obvious when somebody wasn't at worship. Spiritually, that's true for us today. Can a church survive without each of its members? Of course it can. It survives on God. But is it better when everyone's here? The answer is yes. And it's not because we can say, oh, look how big the church is. I have no care for that. And quite frankly, neither does God. What he cares about is I have my people here living out their purpose and part of their purpose is living in community with one another. And so this was a portable tabernacle. And so if you read the how it was just set up, there's two major rooms. Now, not anybody could enter the tabernacle, period. The priests were the ones allowed to enter into the main room. And so they walk in there and be lined with gold, be covered with, with um, and there'd be almond branches and different other kinds of woods. But then there was, as it says, there was the lampstand, the table, and the bread. Now, the lampstand is the menorah. If, you're any, if you've ever seen anything about Hanukkah, right, which we're coming up to shortly, that's the menorah they're talking about. So the menorah is a, an almond branch with six gold pieces inlaid on the sides of it, um, representing six, representing man, needing God to be the center. And there would be oil lit, and the, the whole point of Hanukkah was during the um, Maccabean revolt, that they were going to light the oil even though they were out of oil. And miraculously, the oil of the, of the menorah shone for the time it was supposed to shine. So this has a lot of significance even to Jewish people today. But it was representing that God is the light of the world. And so it burned 24-7. The priest's job was to make sure those lights never went out. That even means when they were walking. It was somebody's job to make sure the menorah was always lit. And you would say, why care? Like some of these symbolisms, some of these rituals have deep, profound meaning. Could you imagine if you were a foreigner and you walked up to the Israelite people and they're like, our God is with us and he is the light of the world. Go light the candles. Right? Instead of, they were saying, well, we want them to see God is with you always. That's what it represented. Why? Because the Spirit of God cannot yet dwell within man. Folks, this is the truth. Without the blood of Jesus covering us, we could not enter into God's presence any kind of way. 
You could not talk to God any kind of way. Folks, these, these people were separated from him and had to do these rituals just to get a glimpse to be with him. And that, that fire could only be lit by Aaron and his sons. And so then you have the altar of incense, right? You had, uh, you had this, this, on the top of the table, there was this brazier of, of gold. And it's constantly burning this sweet incense, representing the prayers of God's people. We see this again in the book of Revelation. We saw this earlier in the book of Hebrews, that, this, that the prayers of the saints are like a precious perfume unto God. That when we pray, it fills heaven with a sweet, sweet smell. Now imagine some of the prayers you prayed. Maybe some of the more ugly ones. Maybe some of the more hard ones. It was no different to God. He cares that much about us that he would not, he would rather have our prayers fill his room than anything else. And then there was the bread. It says the bread of showing. This was called the show bread. There were 12 loaves. They would be in aisles of six. And they would sit for a week, and they represented the 12 tribes of Israel that God would provide for them no matter what. And then we would have to restore this bread every week as God restores bread every week. And that was something the priests could eat, but they couldn't eat the fresh bread, they had to eat the old bread. And so then you have the Holy of Holies, the Holy Holy Place, where God actually dwells. So we're not even to that part yet. And who could go in there? The high priest, and only the high priest. And he could only go in if he was covered with the sacrifice. And the sacrifice was for two things. One, his own sin, because he was not worthy to walk in there. And that's something any of us who are Christians need to remember. Is the only reason we can come before God is God has given us entry by the blood of Christ. But two, he was there to give for the unintentional sins of the Israelites. Folks, we will sin even unintentionally. It's not just conscious choices. In other words, I may sin against somebody and not even realize it. And God covers that too. Could you imagine if he said, I will only forgive you if you confessed every sin you ever committed. And you better hope you remember those unintentional ones. We'd be in trouble. And that's why there's the, we have to be very careful when we say that to be a Christian is somebody who says, well, I have asked God for forgiveness for everything, and I've put my full trust in him, and I have everything, everything, everything. Folks, I don't know enough of my own heart to give everything to God. And quite frankly, if I could, I probably wouldn't have needed God to begin with. My problem is this, is I am lost and broken, and I can only give God that which I can give him. And he saves me out of his covenantal grace. And yes, as time unfolds, I will start to realize there was vastly more darkness in my heart than I thought there was before. But that doesn't mean I wasn't saved before that moment. So we've got to be careful how we view that. So then we have the Holy of Holies. And then there was the Mark of the Covenant, this beautiful box in line with gold. And it says it's cherubim, these angels, wings facing each other, and that is where God dwelled. God did not dwell with his people apart from that place. If Jesus never came, you and I would have no idea what a relationship with God would be like. That's where it was set apart. And what was in there? There is the um, a golden urn of manna showing that God provided for the Israelites supernaturally. The bread shows I can help provide for you in the natural. The manna shows I can provide for you supernaturally. Do you trust me? Then there's the budding of Aaron's staff. In the story, Aaron's staff was used to do all the miraculous things and pronounce judgments. As a matter of fact, there's even a moment where he challenges the priest of Egypt, right? Moses does. Now it's Aaron who's, do, who's doing it. Moses, or Aaron speaking, Moses is throwing the staff down. And their staff's turning to snakes. And so, does their, and so does the staff of Aaron. But Aaron's staff eats the other two snakes. God is showing I am all powerful through this. So he used this instrument of power, but then it budded as if it was an almond branch, and so it started to bear fruit. And that showed that God was going to grow Israel and that the priesthood would be set up as a people who could intervene for them. Then the law, the tablets of the law were there, and that is the covenant. Folks, make no mistake, that law 
is what the folks thought made them righteous before God. But it was the sign of his covenant. He says, if you keep 613 rules, we're in good shape together. Whew, I struggle with Ten Commandments. 613, 365 do's, the rest were don'ts. We could never live up to that standard. And so he's bringing this up. He says, remember what it took for us to be in God's presence before. And then he says, look, I, I can't even go over what all that means. You know, you know, you're first century Jews. I had to explain it because we didn't know. I am not a first century Jew. But that's something we have to remember when we read the scriptures. Is there is somebody he's talking to. And most of the time, it's not me. Now, I get spoken through the Spirit of God and through his scripture. But it's important to contextualize what the scripture is about and who he's talking to. So why does this matter? Because it's very easy for us to take for granted the relationship we have with God today. It's easy to forget what it took for a man to be united with its creator. Because these items were necessary to show the presence of God was on earth. And who could be in God's presence? None of us. We weren't worthy. And then it says that even the priests who were made worthy by these rituals didn't have a clear conscience. Like they couldn't walk before God and say, I'm worthy. They knew they had a few minutes of holiness imparted on them. But then we have Jesus who changes all of that. And before we get there, we need to look at what our heart, where our heart is. Where's our posture? Are we still humble before God? Are we still willing to lay down our, our doubts, our hurts before our Creator? Because it gets really easy for us to take a posture of hubris. God owes me. I deserve X, Y, or Z from God. Look, folks, before, before Jesus, you couldn't even have walked into his presence to ask that of him. And the only reason a relationship was restored is not because mankind held up their end of the bargain. They broke the law, so he sent his son to keep it. So, the, so he's saying, all of these things which were mighty and powerful in the history of Israel were a band-aid for the real solution. So look at Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then the greater, more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once and for all in the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats or calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from the dead works to serving the living God. So he says, look, there's something greater. A greater tent was built. So the work of Christ is greater than any ordinary man's work. He walked into the Holy of Holies by his own merit. Now this is really, really important when you start looking at the Trinity. You're like, wait a minute, isn't he God? Yes, but they are three persons. There are several persons that make one entity. Three who's that make a what, okay? And so he stepped out of glory and became man. And he was around sinfulness, yes. But on the cross, he became sin. The Trinity was not broken. He was not no longer God, but he was sinful at that moment. And what sin did he bear? Not his own, but mine. And every human being that's ever lived, he bore it on the cross for us. So that meant he was no longer worthy to step in the throne room of God. When he had sin parted on him, so the scripture says, but sin could not hold him. Amen. The grave couldn't keep him. He is the firstborn of the dead, and in the resurrection, he overcame sin. He overcame death and won victory. And so then he earned the right, which was his rightful place to begin with. He had to re-earn it to enter back into heaven. And he says, I'm not coming by myself. 
I'm taking my people with me. He didn't have to do that. None of that was he obligated to do. So none of the temples we could build here, no matter how elaborate, no matter how glorious, no matter how fancy, no matter how many billions, trillions of dollars you could put into it, will ever compare to the tent God built. And which is the one that he built? Us. The God of the universe says, I want to dwell in my people, with my people. And it says, you are a temple of the living God. Take care of your body. Take care of it. It is a temple to God himself. Spurgeon says, the Lord Jesus Christ did not come to earth to make reconciliation by the holiness of his life or by the earnestness of his teaching, but by his death. The Lord Jesus did not bring before God the sufferings of others or the merits of others. He brought his own life and his own death. That was the cost for this new temple, not made by human hands, but knit in their mother's womb by God. That's his love for us. So he's saying everything else was the shadow of the substance. Look, if blood of goats or bulls or any of that stuff could purify us, then he would still have us do it. But even, even David says that's not what God looks for. He looks for a broken and contrite heart. Even back when David was around. So then it says, if that could give you a momentary reprieve before God, how much more the blood of Christ covering us can give us an eternal glory. And what is the first thing it purifies? Our conscience. We talk about this a lot, but it's very, very important. He clears our conscience. Why? Because the person who committed all those atrocities, the person that committed those sins, is dead. It says it is buried with Christ in baptism. We are raised to walk in the newness of life. Our baptism symbolizes that person's not around anymore. That means when God looks at the record of our name, there's two names. There's the one but when we were dead and there's one when we were alive. And all the charges get laid on the dead man. And all the rewards get laid on the living. That when we want to beat ourselves up, God says, what sin are you talking about? What offense to me. I have thrown them in the ocean. They are separated as far as the east is from the west. And only the Messiah could fulfill this. So this is the beauty imparted to us. A pure conscience is not earned because we've lived righteously. A pure conscience is given as a gift of the righteousness God's given to us. That I know I can stand before God loved and right, but not on my merit, but on His. So then it says this allows you to put off the dead works and serve the living God. And this word for serving... It's actually not the same word as like a servant or a slave. It's the same word that the priest would serve God. So he's saying, you have these priests. You don't need them anymore. You are a priest before God. He wants you to enter into his presence. And he wants you to speak to him. He wants you to lay down your life on the altar daily before him. You don't need another human being to come in between you anymore. Because you have the perfect high priest. This is where it's all coming together. This is why he talked about the high priest of Jesus so much before this. You do need a mediator, but it's not a man here on earth anymore. It's the person of Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the throne of God, allowing you entry day in and day out. And then if you take the imagery, the lampstand is not moved. The light of the world is with his people. The showbread is now not just the 12 tribes of Israel. It is all who would come into his presence. We are the showbread now before. We are the ones that show the faithfulness of God to the nations. We are the ones that take the message who can be a lighthouse to the lost. That is what God is doing through his people. Let's go to verse 15 and go through 22. So therefore, he is the mediator of the new covenant. So that those who may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where will, a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death. 
since it's not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was in, inaugurated without blood. For every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses and all the people. And he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop. And he sprinkled both in the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. It is the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This scripture basically described the Old Testament view of communion. That once the blood was shed in, in, of the sacrifices, for that moment they could commune with God. That's, that's why it was called communion. For that moment they could commune with God. The difference between today and then is immediately after, God's presence was no longer there. With us today, God's presence dwells within us. He went back to the Holy of Holies. So who mediates the new covenant? Jesus. What does that mean? That means he is the one keeping it on both sides. He's keeping it on behalf of God and now on behalf of man. Because there's no man good enough to keep it before. So he redeems us for what? An eternal inheritance. And he says, how do you get an inheritance? It comes from a will. How do you get a will? How does that become enacted? Whoever has the inheritance to give must die. So he laid his life down so we could have eternal inheritance. And I want to talk about this for just a moment. We are with God in the flesh again. Don't ask me why he wants to do that. I have no idea. But this is what the scripture teaches us. But it is very, very important though. He has spiritual beings that are eternally with him right now. He has no need for more of those. But he created mankind unique and different. We had flesh. And in the Garden of Eden, that was the way it was supposed to be. God wanted to be able to dwell with his people in flesh. Now, there's a lot of philosophical things we could talk about with that. That is another time for another day. But what is important is this. He's coming again. And he's coming for his people. He's coming for his people. Right? And so the final resting, like the scripture says, look forward to heaven. Right? Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you. That's really important. Our souls don't just sleep till Jesus comes back. We are granted access into heaven, just like the priest was granted access into the Holy of Holies. But we are not going to stay there. We are going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. And so we look forward to the resurrection. In other words, the life that we were supposed to have had from the beginning, perfected, where there's no tears, there's no more pain. And so Jesus is representing the covenant so that way when we die, we can go before the throne of God immediately. The promise of Jesus is that when we die and we are his, we are with him. And wherever he goes for an eternity, we are going to. So we're granted the throne room of God, but then we are given a new body unto the resurrection. And so Jesus is keeping the bargain because we can't. Moses was a great prophet, but even he couldn't see his mission. If he's offering the solution, the best thing to do is to take it. Folks, I have a lot of questions. I've asked lots of questions. I've been kicked out of many Sunday school for said questions. You are free to ask them. I will love to walk through them with you. But this particular question, I don't have an answer to, and no man does because we are not God. But I know the solution, and it's offered to us all. But this I do know. God goes through the pain with us. It's undeniable that human pain is also experienced by God. Why? He was in the flesh. He bottles our tears. He, he writes them down. So don't let the fact that some questions may go unanswered keep you from trusting the questions that are or the solutions given. So let's read this as we close. This is 23 through 28. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of true things, 
but in heaven itself. He now appears in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it for him to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest who entered the holy place every year with the blood of his own, the blood not of his own. For then he would have suffered repeatedly since the foundations of the world. But as it is, he's appeared once and for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. And not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He says all these rituals, all these festivals, all these things were a shadow, but they were necessary. God says, look, you have to understand what I've been doing since the foundations of the earth to redeem mankind. This story from the beginning. And so no matter what, he says, what is coming is better. He says, heavenly things are better. But the, the problem is we have these eternal issues inside of us and they can only be cured by eternal things. And that makes sense, right? Only eternal salvation can wipe away eternal debt. Temporal purification can do nothing against an eternal debt. So let me just give an example. If you've been given a bill for $7 trillion and you can pay it off in who knows how long that would take, and you start paying it $10 at a time, it would take forever to pay that off. That is the weight of sin before God. He says, you have this weight that's $100 trillion and you can give me pennies to pay it off. So I'll pay it with my blood, which is worth even more. Which is worth even more. And so then he didn't raise from the dead and then go right back to the earthly temple. He could have. As a matter of fact, he could have set his kingdom up on earth right there. He did. It just wasn't the way any of them expected. His kingdom was through his disciples, his apostles, and all those who would follow after him. But he went not into a temple here, he went to God the Father. So he says, so I have prepared a place for you. He did this for us. He left for us. He went through all of this for us. He could have stayed in heaven and said, you blew it, figure it out, humans. Right? He could have said, earn it, and I'll let the best of the best go to heaven. Instead, he said, for every sin, I'll pay the debt. For every person, I'll pay it. That's the love God has for us. And so we should read this verse that we are solidified in our place before God. Who's mediating the covenant? Jesus. Where is Jesus? With God. If I could lose my salvation, folks, I would. But it gives us an, an allegory. He said, if you would lose your salvation, you would need to go to the priest every time you sinned to make sure you were saved again before you die. Because that's what the high priest had to do every year. You're not following that priest anymore. Jesus paid it all. He paid for my sin. And paid for those who sinned against me. He paid for my sin and those who I've sinned against. But he's paid for the sin of those who sinned against me. Healing starts at that recognition. I cannot begin to even think of restoring relationships, of finding closure, of finding wholeness. Until I realize that my sin is paid for. But so are those who sinned against me. Now, whether they want to live in that reality is up to them. But as far as me, I can find healing. It's the sprout of faith that grows, and it takes time. Folks, our spiritual walk is not overnight. I wish I could say, just like that, you will be perfect. But none of us are. Now, some of us may have a drastic change. That may be your testimony, and that is beautiful. For some of us, that's not the story. We interacted with God and we knew we were God's and we blew it. 
and we blew it, and we struggled, and we continually struggled. Faith takes time to grow. That sprout must be nurtured and cared for. You cannot make that grow any differently, right? Does getting angry at lack of faith make it grow? No. So when someone around you is struggling with faith, why don't you just have faith? It doesn't help it grow. You want to know what helps it grow? The same thing that helps seed grow. You nurture it. You water it. You feed it. You make sure there's ample time in the light. And who's the light? God. He's the light of the world. You make sure that, it's, that the weeds around it are kept away. You make sure that the bugs and the pests are beat away. That's how you help someone grow. You help them fight off the things the devil is trying to do in their life. Don't add to it. And that's something we as Christians can be so bad about. We see someone struggling, and so we beat them down because they're struggling. That doesn't help their faith grow. Only care and nurture and love. And guess what? Is that seed doing anything wrong because it's a seed? No. It's exactly where it needs to be. We talked about this at Family Camp. God brings things exactly when we need them. And not you or I or a pastor can speed that up or decelerate that. So we help each other grow. It can't be rushed. Because here's the good news. The work is finished. It just needs time. It just needs time. The work is finished. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he meant it. The work was done in that moment. So it says it's appointed for men to die. We have one life. And that existence is a gift, no matter how hard it's been. That life is a gift from God. No matter how painful. He saw that the universe was better with you in it than you without it. That's why birthdays are a big deal, folks. The day you were born, the universe was never the same. Because God saw it fit that it needed you. If he didn't want you in it, he wouldn't put you in it. But he's coming again. Folks, this is the hope. This is where our eyes are fixed. And he's not coming to deal with our sin. Our sin's dealt with. He's coming to rescue us. So that's a, that's, there's two ways to look at that. There's the very real way that means in the resurrection. He is coming to take you home. But folks, the moment our mortal shell is shed and we breathe our last, it's because he's come to save me from any more brokenness in this world. Life is a gift, but so is that moment for the people who walk with God. He's coming again, and it says we eagerly are to wait for that. Oh, what a day that all the wrongs get made right. Oh, the day that every tear gets wiped away. Oh, the day that no more suffering, but all of that will pale into the day that we get to be with our Lord in the flesh again as we were intended to. Free from sin, free from doubt, free from pettiness, free from all of those things. He's coming. So hold on. Trust Him a little longer. I ask this at Family Retreat. And before we pray, I, I want to ask this today. How many of you have had a rough 2023? Had some moments that were pretty tough. That's a lot of hands up. How many of you have had a rough 20, like 20 till now? Right? Okay, yeah. I, th I think my feet would have gone up there in a moment. My goodness. Right? Like we've had some hard times. Now, for those of you who've walked with God for just a moment, I want you to raise your hand if you can say this truthfully, that you've seen God turn what the devil meant for evil for good 
In other words, can you raise your hand and say, I have had bad things happen, but I've seen God do something in spite of that. Amen. So I want to give you this encouragement. If this has been a hard year, maybe you are in the middle of something this second. I want to ask you to hold on and trust that he will do it again. He will intervene and turn with the devil meant for, for evil for good. That he made beauty out of ashes in your life before. He will do it again. Because that's the promise. So hold on. Hang in there. None of this is easy, but that's why God's given us his people. So let us be one who nurtures one another and grow in one another's faith. Not tear it down. Not belittle it. Help us be one who can walk beside each other. And when the devil comes with his flies and his bugs, we can help shoo that away. That when the weeds of this world want to sink into our roots, we can help pluck that out of one another's lives. So we may grow more and more like Jesus, who is coming again. Our prayer team is going to be up here if you need to pray with somebody. And folks, if you raise your hand and say, I'm going through something, please pray with someone. Um, the book of James says that if we confess our sins one to another, you find healing. Folks, you're forgiven. God is going to forgive you the moment you said, Lord, I need you. He said, I'm there. But if you want to find healing, he's given us the gift of other people. And I want to assure you of this. Prayer time is not gossip time. Prayer time is not so that that can go and be spread somewhere. It's not so that can somebody be in your business. It's so somebody can stand with you and help shoo away the devil and pluck out those weeds in your life. And who is it that protects us and makes us grow? The Holy Spirit. So that's the picture of praying with one another. So they'll be around if you need to pray with them. But I'm going to ask everybody to just close your eyes and pray with me. Maybe today you raise your hand and you say, I'm having a tough time. If your eyes are closed, I'm going to go ahead and let you know my hand is up. I never would have dreamed I'd be up here barely able to walk. But God is good. I don't even need to ask him why. Why this happened. I just trust that he knows what he's doing. And that good will come out of anything because he promised it would. Folks, if that's you today, pray with somebody. Let it out. Let, let the Lord know, God, I'm struggling, but I want to trust you. And let that seed begin to bud and to grow. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to pretend. God knows your heart. But let it out so you may find healing. Maybe there's some of us today that are struggling with just letting go of our past, of hurts, of those who've hurt us, hurt those we loved, those who've been out to get us. And it's hard to let that go and to forgive. I pray that knowing that you are made right before Christ, there's at least the opportunity for you to find healing. And lay that down at the cross. For you holding on does nothing to the other person, but everything to your soul. So find freedom today. And lastly, maybe you just need some encouragement. I pray that you would know that there is a God who is fighting for you. People in this room who pray for you daily. So that you can grow into the person God has called you to be. So, Lord, you hear the cries of our heart. You know what's going on in our minds, our mental states, our emotional states. Lord, I'm sure if you polled all of us, we'd all have a different answer. But the solution to all of our questions is the same, and it's you, Father. And we know that you can make beauty from ashes. You can turn with the enemy meant for evil for good. And you've given us reminders so today was about the, the Jewish people could look back and remember where you've been and what you've done 
So it is for believers today. We can look back in our lives, and this is why our story is so important, is it gives hope to others that if God can do this for me, He can do this for you. If God could do this for you, perhaps He could do it for me. He's always been there. I can look back on my life that He was there when I was lost, working out my salvation that I did not deserve. Encourage our hearts and help us to walk as we ought to walk. To believe in spite of some of our doubts and questions. Let us not give up the solution because we just don't understand the problem. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And again, our prayer partners will remain. They're there for you. A um, couple of announcements. So say it with me. Say Sunday. December 10th. Let's do it again. Sunday, Sunday. December 10th. That is our Christmas fellowship. It will be in Live Oak at 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock. I, I left my sheet over there. I don't see. Even your pastor messed up. 5 o'clock at the Live Oak uh, Center. If you go online, you can sign up for what to bring. We're going to do a potluck. We're going to have a lot of time to enjoy ourselves. There will be an ugly sweater competition. And the top three will get a prize, okay? So if that is you, go for it. Um, I would die if I wore a sweater. So, like, does it count if I have a cutoff sweater? Like, does that, does that count? I guess it's called a vest. But anyway, uh, again, Sunday the 10th, we will have our, uh, our, our fellowship together. Missional communities are back. Um, so we took, off, took a break last week. We are back this week. There are three places you can meet. Um, if you want to join one, I highly encourage you to. Um, it's been an amazing study. Um, I'm floating through all the groups. 